On today's show, this is for the birds, our feathered friends. First on the perch, the courtship tribulations of the male red-winged blackbird, who really has no reason to sing. Next, a story about the other eagle in Minnesota, all about a giant of a bird, the golden eagle. And later, the bird that has an act to fool you and usually does, all about the killdeer. And our Minnesota Bound Classic this week answers the question, why do birds sing? Those stories and more, next. Minnesota Bound. Brought to you by Minnesota Select GMC Dealers. Hi everybody, Raven and I welcome you to the show. As we stare down the middle of March, that means the bird migration is underway here in this part of the country, which brings up our first story. It's about the life and times of the male red-winged blackbird as it arrives to Minnesota. In truth, it's a love story, but a sad one. This is Minnesota's Song of Spring, sung by the male red-winged blackbird in a melody we who live in the land of snow and ice are so happy to hear. One of the first migrants back to the wetlands and marshes in Minnesota, so when you hear that conkly, it's it's a good thing. You know, you're excited because spring's here and, and right behind it's the warm weather and other migratory birds. They prefer wetland habitat. So if you're in a wetland habitat, um, it's kind of a medium-sized member of the blackbird family. And the males have shoulder patches. They're kind of a scarlet red color lined with yellow. And they have the ability to almost completely cover them up. And they also can kind of really display them and open up their shoulders when they call. Display, call, swing on the cattails like a happy lark. Mother Nature at peace. Is that what's happening here at Ridgefield's Woodlake Nature Center? Uh, not exactly. This is the Red Wings version of the mating game. They're busy birds. Uh, Red Winged Blackbirds are very polygamous. Um, as males set up and establish a territory, when the females come back, they'll try to lure them into their territory. So that's the whole point of coming back early. They set up this territory and, and when the females come back, they're kind of like, look at the area I've set up and they'll draw the females in. So the females will be back a few weeks behind the males and they stay behind um, and they're feeding on insects places south of here where they'll have a lot more insects this time of year. And it increases their overall fitness. So they're gonna increase the amounts of calcium and protein in their bodies. So then when they do migrate north and they mate with the males, they'll be at a high fitness level to lay their eggs. In the meantime, other birds in the marsh are, well, dating, kinda. But not the male red wing. He sings and waits, sings and waits, and struts his feathered tucks for, well, nothing. Then one day, weeks later, mating game on. So the female red blackbird looks nothing like the male. You know, if you're in a wetland habitat and you see something that looks like a larger sparrow that's kind of moving in and out of the cattail, it's probably a female red winged blackbird. She looks like a large sparrow and she has kind of a white eye stripe above her eye. But as soon as the, the female comes back, they will often mate with the male and they'll set up a nest and it's usually kind of a four part system. It's four layers and they're really, really good nest builders, but they look for a sturdy aquatic vegetation and the female does a really good job of weaving building materials from like the most sturdy to the least sturdy as it moves in. And the inside of their nest is usually lined with really soft grass for the eggs. She'll lay a clutch of usually two to four eggs and it takes just under two weeks for them to hatch. Oh, by the way, you should know, the male red wing is kind of a cattail playboy. 
They can have up to 15 females per territory. It's no wonder his song keeps blowing, blowing in the wind. When we return up close and personal with Minnesota's other eagle, that's next. Minnesota Bound, brought to you by Minnesota Select GMC dealers. Connecticut. Seven Clans Casino. And by Starkey Hearing Technologies. Welcome back. Most of us know all about the bald eagle, our national emblem. But did you know there's another eagle in Minnesota, a bigger one, the golden eagle? And we found some to take a look at. For bird watchers, this is gambling the hard way. Roll the dice. And then we'll just look on the trees. See if we can see anything. In this case, anything is a feathered giant with a six foot wingspan, but a creature as rare as eagle teeth in Minnesota. Yeah, I'm looking for golden eagles. They don't breed in Minnesota. They've never been known to breed here that I know of. And so the ones that come here only come in the winter time. Golden Eagles, one of the world's largest, fastest raptors, clocked in dives at 200 miles per hour. Common in America's West, Golden Eagles tend to prey on small mammals, but Goldens are not opposed to swooping down on where deer and antelope play. Yet Goldens remain Minnesota's mystery bird. A few dozen appear when it's cold, but all disappear from the state when it's mating time. And I knew there were a couple of places that people went to look for golden eagles. Uh, one is not too far away near Money Creek uh, in Houston County, and the other one was down by Whitewater State Park, uh, Whitewater Management Area. Well, I went to those locations, and while I was there looking around, I saw golden eagles. But I also thought to myself, well, you know what, there's a lot of habitat up and down the river valley that looks just like this. Why are there golden eagles only here? So I started looking around, and sure enough, I started finding golden eagles. Well, then I started doubting myself because nobody had ever reported that many golden eagles before. So I thought, well, maybe I'm misidentifying them because immature bald eagles and golden eagles can be very similar. So I went back to the bird guides. Nope, I'm, I'm identifying correctly. Most goldens appear to be along the Mississippi River Valley from Red Wing, Minnesota to La Crosse, Wisconsin. But the big birds tend not to hang out with bald eagles. Golden eagles are never by the river. They're always really? inland. They're in areas where they can hunt squirrels, they can hunt tree squirrels, are one of their biggest prey items. This is a bird that's relying on Minnesota and Wisconsin for winter habitat, uh, and that habitat needs to be in good shape so they can get back to the breeding territory. So we wanted to understand the habitat needs a little bit more. We also then wanted to learn where these birds were coming from. So with the project that we have going on, where we've released now five golden eagles with satellite transfers, we're learning that they're not western birds. These are birds that are leaving Minnesota and Wisconsin and then flying straight north uh, into Canada uh, above Churchill, Manitoba, uh, up into Nunavut near the Arctic Circle, uh, also in the Northwest Territories over by Great Slave Lake is where these birds are nesting for the summer and then coming back here for the winter. Slowly, the Minnesota mysteries about golden eagles are unraveling and the legendary tales are beginning to fade. We now know children are safe in the presence of Goldens, but keep an eye on your lap dog. The killdeer deserves an Oscar for acting like an injured bird that isn't. Bird Tricks, coming up. Closed captioning is brought to you by By the Yard. As we continue our birdie theme here on Minnesota Bound, our next story is about a bird that, well, fooled me so many times when I was a boy, I never forgot. The story of the killdeer. 
The sound of birds, songwriter Carly Simon once wrote, stops the noise in your mind. Very doubtful she was referring to this bird, the killdeer. The, the killdeer name is from the, the call that it makes, killdeer, killdeer. This bird plays with your mind. Just ask my grandson, Jake. She has a little back wings that she spreads. And then she spreads her wings out and she, it looks kind of like she's broken, but she doesn't really have it like broken. I just think she's faking or something. Indeed, she's faking, faking a broken wing an act she's made famous. Well, the killdeer, if approached by a potential predator or human, will kind of struggle off of its nest, looking over its shoulder, dragging its wing, spreading its tail to make a predator think it's almost ready to die. And so the, instead of looking for the nest, the predator then follows the killdeer, thinking it's going to get an easy meal. And then just at the point the predator gets close, then it flushes and goes a few more feet, and then it starts over again. And lots of us have fallen for that act. I was a boy walking along when suddenly this bird jumped up in front of me with a broken wing. That's what I thought anyway. So, ah, I'll catch it. A broken wing? I'll catch that bird. So I went on and on, and then suddenly the bird flew away. Not surprising, the deception still works for a very important reason, survival of the nest and its eggs both very vulnerable, laying on the ground. The killdeer is unique in the bird world because it takes advantage of what we do. For example, its nesting sites often consists of our landscaping, gravel, for example, or even gravel pits. It seems like wherever we dig up the sand or the earth, the killdeer nests there. They will nest on very sandy, gravelly sites, like the edge of a parking lot, and they just make a very shallow scrape in the ground, they line it with pebbles, and then they lay four eggs, which are pointed at one end. And so all four eggs point inwards so that this small bird the size of a robin can cover these four huge eggs. So it's kind of like a little puzzle they make. They have to turn the eggs just right. The eggs will hatch in roughly 28 days. The killdeer chick, when it hatches, is called precocious. That means it's ready to leave the nest within three hours. So as soon as it dries out, it's ready to run. And surviving, all thanks to Mama Killdeer and to those of us who've been duped by a bird with a bird-sized brain. If you see a killdeer doing the broken wing act, probably the best thing to do is follow the killdeer because that's gonna lead you away from the nest. <laughs> and it probably makes the bird feel good that it's tricking you. <laughs> what kind of sound is it? No, that's not the... That's ducks. Well, let's not be so sure. Could be another act of killdeer trickery. Hi, I'm Rob Dreesline, managing editor of the Outdoor News Publications. How many times have you caught a small northern pike in a Minnesota lake or river? Well, the DNR wants to fix the so-called hammer handle pike phenomenon that plagues many state fisheries, and throughout 2015, the agency will be unveiling a new pike plan. The state has long had a one-size-fits-all approach to managing pike. There's been a three-fish bag for northern since the 1940s across Minnesota, and the current one over 30-inch rule goes back about 15 years. The problem with that rule is that it places too much pressure on aggressive biting big pike, one of the few fish that will eat those smaller hammer handles. The result is a lot of small pike in state lakes. The new plan would divide Minnesota into three zones, south, northeast, and north central to address the fact that fish see different growth rates and angling pressure in those regions. In the south, where stocking often is needed to maintain pike numbers, the bag would drop to two with a minimum size of 22 to 24 inches. In the north central zone, where there's a lot of small pike, a 10 fish bag has been proposed with a 22 to 26 inch protected slot to allow for larger pike. Only two of those 10 fish could be over 26 inches. Finally, in the northeast, there would be a two fish bag with no harvest of pike over 30 inches. Exceptions for some special regulation lakes would still exist. Many pike plants have appeared over the years to try to improve northern pike fishing. 
and the DNR believes this one remains relatively simple and would improve pike fishing and fisheries for other species across the state. This scribe thinks the plan is a good one, but there will be ample opportunity for you to weigh in and offer your opinion on it too. For complete information on that Pike Plan public review process, read the print version of Outdoor News or check us out online at OutdoorNews.com. Finally, remember that the 2015 fishing opener for walleyes and northern pike on Minnesota inland waters kicks off on Saturday, May 9th. Good fishing to everybody in 2015. I'm Rob Jerislein. Our Minnesota Bound Classic listens and wonders, why do birds sing? Stay with us. Minnesota Bound is brought to you by Tracker Boats. And by Rapala. You know, one of the things we all seem to love come springtime are the songs in the air, the songs of birds. Why do birds sing? We'll try to answer that. In nature, they are the Earth's choir, wearing feathers instead of robes. Their music rings from the tops of trees to the tops of cattails. They sing from on high or out on the prairie or deep in the forest. It's music we hear free and wonder if any of it is for us. I think it's a little, little more basic than that. It's more of a, if you don't sing, you don't get to be holy terry, terry, you don't get to have youngster, you don't have food. I wished it were a little bit more poetic, but it doesn't seem to be. Sometimes they make noises just because they're alarmed. Sometimes they make noises because they're scared. But they, one of the biggest things in the spring, they make noises to, to set up their territories, to let other birds know that this is their home, this is where their wife will be, this is where their kids will be, stay out here. It's a uh, territorial call. Canada geese honk about things like that, and so do western grebes. Sometimes they slightly modify the call just a little bit, which is more attractive as a female, although sometimes it's the same call, it's just that the female decides that this is time to mate, this is gonna be my mate, and so she goes in even though the, the males stay and stay away. Yes, there's some X-rated music out there, loud stuff, rap perhaps, sung to the dance of the sandhill crane. Sometimes this feathered choir sings in unison, birds of a feather, swirling as if every move was choreographed. But by whom? A lot of times they're location calls and sometimes different, different uh, groups of birds identify each other's, not only their voices, but their call notes locating each other within either a flock or a skein or a troop or a murder or whatever, whatever the group is called. In winter's cold and snow, birds tend to sing a different tune. In Minnesota, there's not a lot to sing about. <laughs> uh, they don't sing in terms of territorial. It's still a, the group calls. Ravens and crows are, are amazing creatures. Uh, a friend of mine who studied them claims that they have 43 different call notes. And they really do have a communication system. And they oftentimes will communicate when they dislike something, or certainly they communicate when there's an owl in the area. Some birds around us are mostly silent, but I suppose Having to eat carrion every day, well, it's not much to sing about. Our national emblem doesn't say much either. In their courtship flight, bald eagles would rather dance than sing. They do these huge aerial displays where they'll be, they'll be flying right side by side and all of a sudden one will flip under the other and they'll grasp talons. And sometimes they'll, they'll just plummet. But it's a pre-courtship type display. Finally, there's that tiny, tiny bird that never knows the words. It just hums, hums every song. But I'd say, who cares? Maybe in the bird world, as it is with us, it's the song in your heart that counts. <laughs> oh, the many songs of birds. And just think about how sad the world would be if springtime was quiet. Thankfully, not. Well, that about does it for us. Remember, introduce a kid to the great outdoors. I'm Ron Sharon. Of course, always my bird dog, Raven, is the star of the show. <laughs> yes, yes. Forever. Transportation provided by 
from your transportation. Call 1-800-899-7433. For more information on these stories and more, catch us on the web at mnbound.com.